Good morning and welcome to our worship service here at Faith Church. We certainly want to welcome those of you who uh, showed up this morning and also those of you who are listening online. Um, as we begin our worship this morning, please stand as we sing, Who is He in Yonder Stall? announcements this morning. Our Board of Elders is happy to announce uh, that our Faith Church members approved the 2021 budget, as well as new, school, new board members, uh, Steve Irvin and Dan Saucy. And we do ask that you please join us in prayer for the Lord's wisdom and guidance as we begin this new year. Just a reminder that our Adult School of Christian Living will be resuming next Sunday. That's January 10th at 9.30 a.m., and that will be back in the lounge. As we have mentioned over the past several months, um, offering is a form of worship, and although we're not able to pass the offering plates, they are located at the door, and we do thank those of you who are contributing that way and also uh, through the mail. Conrad. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you. Um, Lord, we are gathered here to praise you. Some of us in person and some online, Lord, but our intent is as a body of believer to praise you. And we pray, Lord, that our, our service today would be pleasing to you, that you would be glorified. Um, and Lord, that um, we would grow in our knowledge and our love of Christ um, and in our fellowship with each other. Lord, we praise you and worship you because nothing is hidden from your sight, that all things are open and laid bare before you. Um, Lord, we just thank you for salvation through Christ, our one mediator between man and God, um, Jesus Christ, our great high priest. Lord, we thank you that, Jesus Christ, that you know and understand our weaknesses and sympathize with us in our weakness and our sin. Um, since you were tempted in a similar way to us, um, but were without sin, and because of that, um, as a perfect sacrifice, we can come before your throne with confidence to seek mercy and grace in time of need. Lord, we just thank you for um, blessing us in 2020. Although a difficult year, Lord, we know it was no surprise to you. And with the new year before us in 2021, we pray, Father God, that you would help us as a church to be one that um, stays connected to you as the head of the church, our Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray for wisdom as we um, seek a new pastor and a new youth pastor. 
Um, Lord, we know that you know who those people are. And we pray, Father God, that you would lead us to those people. Lord, there are so many um, ill and in need, and we, we pray for them. We lift their need up to you. Um, Lord, we pray that you would be glorified through their need. Lord, through the way that people respond to you um, and point people to Christ, even in an adversity. Um, we just thank you for your great promises of um, a heaven that waits us with no crying, no pain, and no tears, um, whatever happens here on earth. And we pray, Father God, that you just help us to glorify you, even in difficult circumstances. Lord, we pray for um, those working on the COVID vaccine distribution, Lord, that that would um, be distributed quickly and efficiently. And even though um, there are many who, who are not interested in taking it, Lord, we pray for, Father God, that we would be able to establish that herd immunity quickly in this country and in other countries too. Lord, lift up Addie Olson to you, um, who is heading off to YWAM um, this coming week. Um, Lord, in a, in a mission field that awaits her out there, training at DTS and then an a missions trip. And just pray for blessing on her. Um, Lord, help her to be a witness for you as she um, learns, um, learns the skills of being a missionary, Lord, um, and the gifting that you've given her. Um, and Lord, we pray that you would help her to be effective um, as, a mission, as a missionary. Lord, we lift up um, Dr. Pauli today and we pray for, for blessing on him that you would um, help him to recall that all that he has studied. Um, and Lord, help us um, to be attentive. Um, and Lord, that we would learn from, from your word um, and that you just bless Dr. Pauli with that, the clear communication and clear thought um, as he shares his message today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing together, How Great Is Our God. <clears throat>
I have the pleasure of introducing and welcoming Dr. John Pauley to our pulpit this morning. Um, and I always think it's helpful to know a little bit about the person that's going to be uh, speaking. And so John forwarded his resume so that I would have some information for the introduction. I'm so glad he did. And I wish I had about 20 minutes to introduce him because uh, his resume is impressive and also interesting. Um, and I felt many connections just from uh, reading his resume. I suspect that his resume is impressive and interesting, not only because of his experience, um, but also because he is what I would consider a communications expert. So John has his Master of Arts degree uh, and also his PhD in speech communications from the University of Texas in Austin. And prior to that, he earned his bachelor's in Christian education from Southwestern College. Up until last year, John was the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences for Eastern University. And prior to that, he served as professor and chair of the Department of Communication Studies. Our son, Eric, is a communications graduate from Eastern. Um, and he had a wonderful experience there. And he had fond memories of his interactions with John uh, when I asked Eric if he knew uh, Dr. Uh, Pauly, uh, he said, yes, absolutely. And he remembers um, him always referring to him as Whistler, uh, yelling his name. And I suspect that John was probably saying, Whistler, how come you didn't turn in your latest assignment? Um, John is a member of two running clubs. And in his words, yes, it's about running, um, but it's more importantly about running together. He has run 25 marathons and completed three Boston marathons. And that's impressive. Um, a marathon is 26.2 miles, um, for those of you who don't run. And in turnpike perspective, because we're on the turnpike a lot, that's from the Morgantown exit to the Valley Forge exit, which is a long way to run. Um, and the Boston marathon is not something you just uh, sign up and pay your uh, fee and run, uh, you do have to qualify. So that means um, that you have to run at a certain pace in order to participate. Uh, John was ordained in May of 1977 in the First Baptist Church of Prescott, Arizona. Uh, Arizona is where he grew up. He served in churches in Arizona, Indiana, and in this area. And he is currently pastor of group development for the Grace Valley Fellowship uh, in Phoenixville. And I could go on and on, but maybe I could sum it up by quoting his ultimate desire that he states in his resume summary. John's desire is to follow Jesus wherever he leads. Please keep, give a warm Faith Church welcome to Dr. John Pauley. I'd like to meet this guy. Uh, well, good morning. It's so wonderful to be here um, and to worship with you. And uh, I'm thankful to God uh, for um, 
the opportunity that I have. Uh, Mike Harder um, is an elder at our church in uh, Phoenixville, and uh, and uh, I think it's through Mike's uh, recommendation that I was asked to speak here. And of course, uh, you know, you mentioned Eric, and uh, a word of explanation is in order. Um, my first teaching responsibility was at St. Mary's College in northern Indiana, right across the street from the University of Notre Dame. And I learned very quickly that um, about 50% of my students, their first name was Mary. Um, and the other, like 25%, were Aaron. Uh, good uh, Catholic girls' names. And um, so I realized very quickly, if I said Mary, half the class would respond. So I switched over to last names, and, I, and that habit stuck. I don't recall ever having said, Whistler, where's your late homework? But it's entirely possible that I, that I said something like that. It wasn't that he was in trouble. And that, that was kind of off-putting to many of my students. Why are you calling us by our last names? Are we in the military? And, uh, but there was actually a very benign explanation. Well, let me pray for us uh, before we open God's Word this morning. And... Uh, will seek his face. Father, uh, we are so thankful to be here. Uh, we are thankful for uh, you, our God, who is faithful from generation to generation, from age to age. We are thankful that you are present with us here in this room this morning, but you're present with those who are connecting with us uh, online. We are thankful, God, that in the midst even of the strangest circumstances, that you are God, that you are sovereign, that your will and your plans will not be thwarted. We pray, O oh Lord, that in our time together around the Word this morning, that you would speak, that uh, you would be present to us, and I pray for each one of us, uh, that we are, our hearts cry in prayer would be, speak to me, Lord, this morning. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. The mind does strange things. As I was preparing to preach this message, and just to give you an indication, our message this morning is a meditation on Psalm 84. If you have a hard copy, if you have digital copy, you might want to open your, your device or your book. I guess a book would be a device. It's, all, it's technology, it's older technologies, newer technologies, but whatever you've got, Psalm 84. So anyhow, I was reflecting on this uh, psalm. And I was on the second verse, and which reads, My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. As I reflected on these verses, my mind ran to another familiar psalm, Psalm 42. And the first two verses in that ancient psalm read, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Now, this is all pretty orthodox and sanctified stuff, right? Kinds of things that preacher would think about as he's meditating and reflecting on a message. But then something strange happened. As I was thinking of these verses and trying to enter into the experience of the psalmist, this phrase came to mind. Hungry heart. And within nanoseconds, I found myself humming and then singing Bruce Springsteen's song by that title. Maybe you've heard it. Got a wife and kids in Baltimore, Jack. I went out for a ride and I never went back. Like a river that don't know where it's flowing, I took a wrong turn and I just kept going. The chorus, everybody's got a hungry heart. Everybody's got a hungry heart. Lay down your money and play. You play your part. Everybody's got a hungry heart. Weird. I'll admit that. I'm meditating on an ancient psalm, and the words of a 1980s pop song come to mind. And here's the really weird thing. I hate that song. <laughs> I hate it. I can never get out of my mind the picture of the wife and kids in Baltimore who come to the painful realization that Jack, or whatever his name is, is not coming back. According to Springsteen, this guy has a hungry heart, but I'm thinking about the wife and kids who have a broken heart. 
So I could just have fallen on my knees and said, Lord, please forgive me for thinking about this. Let's get back to business. But not in this day and age. Uh, So what do I do? I go to my computer and I enter the Springsteen tune on my internet search browser. And I come up with that font of all wisdom and knowledge, Wikipedia. And what do I discover? First, that Springsteen wrote this song originally for a group called the Ramones, but on the advice of his manager, he decided to record it for himself. Music trivia. You can never know when you might be able to use that. But second, that Springsteen took the idea and the phrase hungry heart from the poem Ulysses, written by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Now, I have to admit I was a bit incredulous. A 1980s pop song uh, taking inspiration from a blank verse poem written by a Victoria-era writer seemed a bit odd, but I looked up the poem. To refresh your memory, Ulysses came back from Ith- back to Ithaca, not the one in New York, after many hero- heroic battles and settles into being king again. But it doesn't take long, and Ulysses is bored. No other way to put it. Listen to him. It little profits an idle king by this still hearth among these barren crags, matched with an aged wife, I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race that hoard and sleep and feed and know not me. I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the lees. All times I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly both with those that love me and alone on shore and when through scudding drifts the rainy Hyades vex the dim sea, I am become a name. For always roaming with a hungry heart, much have I seen and known cities of men and manners, climates, councils, governments, myself not least, but honored of them all, and drunk delight of battle with my peers far on the ringing plains of windy Troy. I am part of all that I have met Yet all experience is an arch where through gleams that untraveled world whose margin fades forever and ever when I move. Wow. So old King Ulysses is bored. He has no desire to rule over a savage race that hoard and sleep and feed and know not me. He continues, I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the lees. He remembers his days on the road. And he looks at his life now and he goes, that was much better. So I get it. Some guys uh, are not cut out for settling down and hanging around town or even if they're the king. And like the heroes in the old westerns, Ulysses longs for the day when he can throw the blanket and the saddle over his faithful steed and ride off in search of new adventures. All of a sudden, I'm starting to feel a little bit better about the Springsteen song. I'm still not a fan of Jack. And still feel the pain of his wife and kids, but I get it. Some people long for the open road, road trip, the adventure, the journey. So you're asking yourself, (laughs) how far down this rabbit trail am I going to go? What does this have to do with Psalm 84? Bruce Springsteen, channeling Lord Tennyson, sings the song of the hungry heart that longs for the open road and adventure. The psalmist does not use the phrase hungry heart, but it's not too much of a stretch to say that he has a heart that is hungry and longs for God. Two completely different kinds of hunger. Here's a possible connection, though. Halfway through Psalm 84, we read this expression, blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. The literal translation of this last phrase of verse 5 is, quote, in whose hearts are the highways. In whose hearts are the highways. So we could talk this morning about a hungry heart. Earlier in the longing, either in the longing for the epic journey that Tennyson captures or the type the psalmist sing about, But I think that what best captures the sentiment of Psalm 84 is the phrase, highway heart. 
highway heart. So this morning, I'd like to walk you through Psalm 84. This psalm is not textually identified as a song of ascent. I'm, if you're familiar with the psalms, you know that there are some that are songs of ascent, people on their way to, 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 to Jerusalem or to the temple. But I believe this psalm captures the spirit, the heart of the pilgrim on her or his way to Jerusalem. Here at the outset, I want to acknowledge my indebtedness to Eugene Peterson, the author of what, to my mind, is a modern Christian classic, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. Any of you ever seen that book, read it, heard of it? If you haven't, I would strongly suggest that you read it. Peterson basically paraphrases up and reflects on Psalms 120 to Psalm 134. Those songs are labeled as songs of ascent. So I'm, an, I'm indebted to Peterson, and I, I would encourage you to read that book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. For our purposes this morning, I'd like to identify what I am calling three movements in Psalm 84, three movements. And the first movement is, I long for God's house, which is pretty much verses one through four. I long for God's house. As we have noted, this psalm opens with the language of hunger and thirst, of deep longing. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Add verse 10. Certainly spending just one day in your temple courts is better than spending a thousand elsewhere. I would rather stand at the entrance of the temple of my God than live in the tents of the wicked. And referring back to Psalm 42, which I mentioned earlier, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. It seems strange to dissect this deep, heartfelt language. Aren't these words something we should just sing or feel and not analyze? Well, I think that that idea belies a bifurcation of head and heart that is not consistent with the Bible's view of us as human beings. We think and we feel, and it is a wise idea to analyze both our thoughts and our feelings. These verses convey several ideas. The first one is this. The temple is God's house. And the second is, as such, it is the most desirable of places. Now, we as American evangelicals don't have this type of lived experience. We don't associate God with a particular place. Maybe we do. But not to the extent that the Jews in the Old Testament era saw the temple in Jerusalem as that sacred place, that place where God is. Now, they had a, a, a broader view of God, and if you read the Old Testament scriptures, even the Psalms, you'll find that there is no place that we can hide from God. God's Spirit is everywhere. God is everywhere. But in a sense, the Jews had this identification of God with the temple and with Jerusalem. It's obvious that the psalmist has this attitude. Most scholars feel that this, uh, the author of this psalm was someone who might have been a Levite who had served in the temple, but for some reason, whatever it was, he was no longer able to be there. Today, Roman Catholics might see the Vatican in Rome as this sort of place. Muslims might see Mecca as just such a place. When I was a young boy, uh, I viewed the sanctuary of the First Baptist Church of Prescott, Arizona as just such a sacred place. But as my Protestant and Baptist sensibilities developed, I realized that it was a mistake to identify God with any particular building or room. I learned that the New Testament... And in the New Testament, the early Christians would meet in homes or wherever they could meet. Read the book of Acts, the second chapter. Further, I learned that the phrase, the house of God, 
as used in the New Testament, was applied not to a building, but to God's people. Hear what Peter writes. As you come to him, you, us, as we come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Or hear what the Apostle Paul writes. Consequently, you, Christians, Christ followers, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of His household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus Himself as the chief cornerstone. In Him, that is in Christ, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple to the Lord. That's you and me. We're the living stones. We're being built together into that holy temple in the Lord. And in Him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. So our experience is quite different from that of the ancient Hebrews. To enter into the experience of the psalmist, though, we have to appreciate the sense in which the temple represented the very presence of God. And the opening movement of this song is one in which the psalmist describes in a language that may seem somewhat strange to us, an intense desire to be in the presence of the Lord. While we may not associate this desire to be in the Lord's presence with a particular place, we can resonate with the underlying sentiment, can't we? There are those moments, and they could be precipitated by a variety of things. Silence, we could be reading scripture, we could be singing a hymn or a song, maybe a devotional, and we get that sense that we are separated from God. We are not where we should be. We long to be close, closer to God. Somehow the relationship is not what it once was. Where there was warmth and heat, now there is maybe lukewarmness or maybe coldness. We long to be near God, to be in intimate relationship with Him. We sing the words of these songs. They capture what we... uh, what we feel as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for you, God, the living God. Now, there are three blessed statements in, psalm, in this psalm. And the first stanza, verses 1 through 4, conclude with this one. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. The opening verse of of this psalm crescendos with this glorious picture of God gathered in the temple in Jerusalem, God's people gathered in the temple in Jerusalem, loudly singing songs of praise. Like a family reunion, God's children, His covenant people have come together in God's house, and it's time to celebrate. How blessed, how happy are those worshipers. That's movement one. I long for God's house. But movement number two, we could label, I know where I am. The flip side of the coin of longing for God's house is the painful realization that I am not there. I am somewhere else. I am not in my Father's house. Now, for the author of Psalm 84, that separation was geographical. He was somewhere other than Jerusalem. For us... We may feel that what we aspire to, what we hope for in our relationship with God, is not our present experience. The words of Psalm 84 again, my soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord, my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Psalm 42, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. Now, we could add words from other psalms that speak the same language of longing and yearning. 
But is this language foreign or strange to us? Does this ring true to our experience? Do we sense that in some meaningful way, there is a distance that separates us from God? That metaphorically speaking, that God is there and I am here. Or is it possible that we have settled in? We're comfortable. Sure, things aren't perfect. They aren't the way they should be in my relationship with God. But they're not so bad. We've accepted it. Earlier I made reference to Eugene Peterson's A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And the first of the psalms that he discusses is Psalm 120. And it's a lament that ends with these words, Psalm 120, verses 5, 6, and 7. Woe to me that I dwell in Meshach, that I live among the tents of Kedar. Too long have I lived among those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. We feel a similar rhythm. Here is where I dwell. I dwell among the, in Meshach, among the tents of Kedar. I long to be here. I long to be in Zion. I long to be in God's house. And woe is me. I sense, painfully sense, that separation. Eugene Peterson finds it quite fitting that this psalm is the first of these 15 ascent psalms. Songs that are sung as the people make their way to the temple in Jerusalem. And here's what Peterson writes. Quote, A person has to be thoroughly disgusted with the way things are to find the motivation to set out on the Christian way. Did you hear that? A person has to be thoroughly disgusted with the way things are to find the motivation to set out on the Christian way. Hear the psalmist. I'm tired of the tense of Meshach and, and, and Kedar, I long, I long for something better. This is not acceptable. The psalm, of the writer of Psalm 84 expresses something similar. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Or as Peterson in his message uh, translation renders the, the, these verses, one day spent in your house This beautiful place of worship beats thousands spent on Greek island beaches. I'd rather scrub floors in the house of my God than be honored as a guest in the palace of sin. The chapter in Peterson's book that deals with Psalm 21 is labeled repentance. Repentance. And he concludes that chapter with this sentence. Repentance. The first word in Christian immigration. Christian immigration. Sets us on the way to traveling in the light. I dwell here. It's time for me to migrate there. I live in Meshach and Kedar, but oh, how I want to be in the house of God and This leads us to the third movement in this psalm, which is, I set my feet on the path of pilgrimage. As I said before, there are three blessed statements in Psalm 84. We've already seen the first one in verse 4. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. The third blessed statement is found in the final verse. Lord Almighty, Blessed is the one who trusts in you. The second blessed statement is found in verse 5. Blessed are those who trust in you, whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Now that's my, that's the NIV translation. Pilgrimage is a foreign concept to most of us, but it was a very important concept to the Jews. They were commanded by God in Exodus 23 and Exodus 34 to come from their tribal homes and gather together as God's people three times a year. The Feast of Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. As we we read through the verses about the early life of Jesus, 
when Jesus went up to the temple with Mary and Joseph, it was on one of these pilgrimage trips. But what comes to our mind when we, when we hear the word pilgrimage? Christians in 2021 in the United States. Well, I doubt that many of you have taken many pilgrimages. Maybe you have. But when I think of pilgrimage, I think of uh, the Middle Ages. I think of the Canterbury Tales, which I had to read when I was in high school. Jeffrey Chaucer. Um, any of you have to, were subjected to the same thing that I was? Okay. Chaucer would like us to think that uh, these tales were what the p- sorts of stories the pilgrims would tell to each other as they were on their way to Canterbury Cathedral uh, after a long day of journey. The Crusades were undertaken so that Christian pilgrims from Europe could safely make their way to Jerusalem. In the Middle Ages, there was nothing greater than to take a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Even today, pilgrims go to great expense and put their lives at risk by going to Graceland or Disney World. That's a joke. Uh, uh, Seriously, though, people travel today to Jerusalem or Lourdes or along the Camino de Santiago in Spain or to other sacred sites, but quite often these journeys are undertaken as an act of penance or to seek out healing. During the uh, pandemic, every, about every race was canceled, uh, literal race. There were virtual races, and some entre- uh, entrepreneurial guy came up with the idea of having these virtual races, and I did the virtual uh, Camino de Santiago run, which is 480 miles. Um, and, it, you know, everything's on an app these days, and so you can pull up the app, and you could see where you were. You start out in, in France, up in the Pyrenees, and you work your way across northern Spain to this, this uh, cathedral in, in uh, 480 miles away. It took me a while, but uh, I got there. Um, that's one of my bucket list things is to do that pilgrimage, uh, 480 miles. You're supposed to walk. That'll take a while. The thing of it is, though, is these are sec- secular pilgrimages undertaken by people with uh, or no particular spiritual faith tradition, but who believe they, they might find something by hiking a sacred road. There tends to be an individualistic flavor to such faith trips. But this is, was not so for the Jews of the day, in the days of the Psalms. These were journeys undertaken communally to refresh their memories of God's saving ways, of renewing their commitments as God's covenanted people, and to respond as a blessed community to the best God had for them. So they did these pilgrimages to refresh their memories, to renew their commitments, and to respond as a blessed community to God's promises. Peterson points out, the Hebrews were a people whose salvation had been accomplished in the Exodus, a pilgrimage whose identity had been defined at Sinai and whose preservation had been assured in the 40 years of wilderness wandering. So much of their life was pilgrimage, was walking. The Jews are familiar with the experience of immigration. It was a central part of their communal story from Abram, who had been called to leave what he knew, to go to a land promised him by God, The Hebrews were a people on a journey, a pilgrimage. And once they settled into the promised land, the land that God promised them, they were commanded to reenact three times a year. Don't forget, don't forget that you are people whose hearts should hold the highways. Three times a year they were to be on these journeys of faith and to travel to Jerusalem to remember and to worship the God who had called them to himself. As I said before, the literal translation of verse 5b is, in whose hearts are the highways. Brothers and sisters, we are people on a journey. We are not sedentary. We shouldn't be sedentary. We are people on the highways of God. The life of, a pilgrim, life of faith is a life of pilgrimage. Followers of Jesus are people with the highways of God in their hearts. But let's be honest. Sometimes a road trip can be exciting for a few miles, and then, like our kids, we start asking God, are we there yet? This third blessed statement reads, 
Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Here's the point. Pilgrimage, or the mindset of pilgrimage, is transformative. How we see the journey makes all the difference. How we see the journey makes all the difference. Verse 6, as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. The valley of Baca, depending on your translation, uh, you may read all kinds of notes uh, as to what that means. Uh, Valley of weeping, valley of poplars. Uh, Sometimes people talk about the Baca could mean either weeping or or balsam trees. But what we get here is the picture the psalmist paints of an arid wilderness being transformed into a place of desert pools. A barren place becomes an oasis. A valley of weeping is turned into a meadow of spiritual refreshment. You can almost hear the words of the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling. In the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up. Every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all people will see it together. The destination transforms the journey. Not just wandering. Not just meandering. There's a destination. And that destination makes the journey qualitatively different. It is no longer a drudgery, it is delight. It goes from being a weary and exhausting trip to an odyssey in which we gain strength step by step. As the old hymn goes, we're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion, and every step takes us closer to the mountain of God. Peterson reads, writes, we are traveling in the light, Toward God who is rich in mercy and strong to save. That's what we see. It is Christ, not culture, that defines our lives. It is the help we experience, not the hazard we risk that shape our days. That's what transforms the journey. So we started out by talking about a hungry heart. There is the Ulysses, Bruce Springsteen hungry heart. We could call it wanderlust. It is that desire that beats in human hearts that seeks self-fulfillment through exploration. The journey is the thing. And then there is the hungry heart of the psalmist. Like an animal that is dying of thirst, like a child separated from her parents and home, the psalm writer sings of a deep yearning for God. And as we have discovered this morning, this is but the first movement in this ancient song. Perhaps we could say that a hungry heart A heart that is starved for God is the condition from which a highway heart develops. The highway heart is the desire that beats in the chest of those who are quickened by the living touch from God. We are people on a road trip, but the journey is not the thing. The destination is the thing. We have a sense of where we are and a sense of where we long to be. We have the highways of God etched in our hearts. So in closing, let's talk about where you and I go from here. First, let me ask you this question. Which way are your feet pointed? I attended a church in northern Indiana, Granger Community Church, for a number of years. Uh, Mark Beeson was the founding pastor and lead pastor when I was there. And uh, Mark passed away within the last uh, two or three weeks. Uh, Cancer um, claimed his life. But I I can see Mark standing behind a lectern, and I could see him saying, which way are your feet pointed? It makes a difference. If your feet are pointed this way, that's where you're going. If your feet are pointed this way, that's where you're going. Which way are your feet pointed? Are they pointed toward the city of God? Or are they pointed the opposite direction toward the tents of Kedar? 
Now, you may say, well, you know, John, in my case, it's not that simple. Is it this binary, zero, one? Is it e- in either or? And the short answer to that question is yes. It is that simple. Will the next step you take take you closer to Jesus or further away? Which way are your feet pointed? Secondly, as we noted, the songs of ascent were sung by Hebrew pilgrims as they went together to celebrate as a covenant community. So here's my second and final question. Who are you walking with? Are you in community with others? Are you taking steps with other pilgrims toward Christ? God doesn't call us as individuals. God calls us into his family. God calls us into the church, which is a group, a koinonia, a Brothers and sisters, a family. Connect with your brothers and sisters. Lace up your hiking boots together and set out on God's highway. Notice the pronouns in these verses. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. And while the, uh, the psalmist does not argue this point, I will. It is in the presence of others, as we bear each other's burdens, as we sing each other's songs, as together we point our faces toward the mountain of God, that we go from strength to strength till we appear before our Father in Zion. Amen. Join me in prayer. Gracious God, you have called us to yourself. You have called us to be together with other believers. You've called us into a family. You've called us into the church. You've called us not to come and sit, but you've called us to pilgrimage. You've called us to a life of journey where the ultimate destination is our heavenly home. But in the meantime, O Father, our lives are transformed as we see the destination. As the old hymn goes, we're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. The beautiful city of God. Father, I pray for us. I pray that in moments uh, this week as we reflect on this message and on the teaching of Psalm 84, that we would ask ourselves the question, Which way are my feet pointed? By your spirit, Lord, enable us. We are weak, but you are strong. Give us the strength to stand and to point our feet in the right direction and to take steps toward you today. We pray these things in in the name of the one who walked before us and who leads us the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand now for the benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now, today, this week, and forever. Go in peace.